Yeah, yeah, let's, uh, we can get started here. Um, let me see if I can pull up a little bit more of my screen so I can see things a little bit better. Uh, let's see, we just brought in somebody new. Oh, there's Rhoda. Hello, Rhoda. Hello. So we've, uh, we've got a small quaint group here this time around. Uh, we'll see if anybody else joins us. Uh, Rhoda, did you get the meeting notes that I sent out about a week or so ago? I did, and I just pulled up the agenda because I'm okay. my, my work computer. All right, great. And uh, Steve's got that agenda so that we can all look at it. Uh, right now, uh, it looks like we've got Rhoda, Heather Petrus, uh, no John Sosi right at the moment, but we'll see if he's tied up with work. Uh, Lloyd Haskins, Captain Platt, Lieutenant Cornelius, Jimmy Genetino. Um, I don't know if Nicole Stewart was planning to be on this one or not. And Kathy Aguilar, I haven't heard from her. Uh, Sergeant Gelfus is on. We never did really hear back from Jeff Emerson from, I forget, was he uh, Port Byron, Village of Port Byron? I'm uh, not sure. sure. Okay. And uh, Denise Spingler has joined us. So Rhoda, uh, I'm sure you're aware, but uh, Denise runs the 911 center. And some of the questions that came up at our last meeting had to do with how calls are received and then what agencies are notified and, and how that process takes place. So I thought that uh, if Denise could share that with us, um, and answer any particular questions, that would be great. And she's agreed to do that. So thank you, Denise, for that. Um, hey, Jeff, did we, uh, and it might've been, it might've been in the notes and I didn't see it, but it, did, uh, did we offer the opportunity for a uh, member of the district attorney's office to join us? Yes, uh, my request was not responded to. Okay. At, at all, so there, there was no no response at all. It wasn't uh, a negative response. It was just a lack of response. So, um, unfortunately, uh, some of those specific issues uh, we can't address right at the moment. But uh, we'll keep them on the list and and uh, keep that in mind moving forward. Maybe if we have some uh, specific questions, some kind of agency specific questions, we can. Uh we can kind of draft either a, uh, you know, a, a letter or an email or, or something to, to try and have a, a, a dialogue in that way if we can. Yeah, if that's uh, something that you can help facilitate, that would be uh, fantastic. Absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Writing myself a few notes here, sorry. So Jeff, this is Steve. Uh, one of the reasons that um, we've asked Denise uh, to join us and thank you Denise for joining us, most welcome. Um, there were a couple of questions just in general about uh, how calls are dispatched uh, and, and what information the officers are given uh, when they're sent to a location uh, about what may be happening or what the situation is. And I would certainly, for anybody that participated in the last meeting, if you, know, you can clarify you know, that introduction right there a little bit better, uh, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, but that's, I think, uh, one of the main reasons they said, let's see if we can get uh, Denise Spengler to come in from 911 and sort of give an overview of how that works. I, I think Denise, one of the one of the big things was that um, kind of how uh, how they get the how the dispatcher gets the information from the the caller and uh, gets that information out to the people on the other side of the radio and and how it's not unusual for an officer or a EMS or, or whoever to find out that uh, the situation that was that they thought they were getting into is not necessarily you know the the situation that they end up with and and how that all kind of 
happens was was one of the big questions. So <clears throat> from a dispatch perspective, um, keep in mind that dispatchers are only as good as the information given. So, you know, they'll interrogate the caller based on, you know, tell me exactly what's going on. Um, you know, trying to, to get details of what is happening right now. Um, and that information is all provided to the responders. The response is based on whether or not it is a law enforcement issue, you know, is it a domestic, is it a um, mental health call where there's not been any um, act of, um, you know, perhaps suicide at that point or if it is, um, you know, a cardiac call, the, it's all, the responses are all based on the nature of the call. Um, so there are times like Fred said that, you know, officers might get on scene and find something different than what they were dispatched to. And that's simply because we don't have eyes on the scene. Um, the, the information that we're getting is all over the phone based on what the caller is telling us. And, and you know, we give out anything that we get. So, Denise, I, I'm aware, Denise, that when you get a medical call, there's a, a sequence of questions, right, that essentially take a dispatcher through prioritizing the call, and then that corresponds to um, the dispatcher being able to actually walk the caller through some basic first aid steps. Is there yeah. some, anything similar when it comes to law enforcement to help prioritize the call or determine what agencies are notified? Any, anything similar on that side that you, either that you yeah. utilize or that's a, available? We don't utilize. So we use what's called emergency medical dispatch for medical calls. And that takes dispatch through a structured series of calls based on call nature. Um, and then the call is dispatched. For law enforcement, it's different. Um, no two calls are the same and, and every call can take a turn at any point um, as far as the information given. So, you know, they have a general list of questions for each call type, but, you know, based on the information given, you know, they, they can take a turn on, on those questions. So um, there's really not a, a true structure for that per se. Um, it's it's much more difficult with you know a domestic somebody could be in if, if it's an in progress call it's automatically priority one um if it's something that the one of the parties has left or it was texting you know it might not be as high of a priority um medical calls if they are you know depending on the nature of the call they might be um, what we call als which is advanced life support which is a higher priority call um depending on you know the the condition of the patient so law enforcement calls just aren't as easy or as structured. So you really have to sift through what the caller is telling and listen to background, see what's going on and, and base your, your response on a lot of those different criteria. Denise, I will say thank you um, for your time today because this, this your explanation clears up a lot of confusion um, and specifically for lay people, um, there is an example of how I was introduced to how things are handled um, probably about a week and a half ago, that unfortunate incident that happened on Thanksgiving. And yeah. you know, to a lay person, when you think that you're calling 911, everybody shows up. Like you, mm -hmm. no one, unless you work in the field, no one is even thinking that based on the description of what you're saying, that's what's gonna get sent to the emergency. So, um, you know, I had an unfortunate education, uh, you know, around that, but I'm so happy to know that it is, you know, it's an interaction between the caller and the dispatch. And there are these follow-up questions that happen. Um, so I'm, clearly I knew that there was a process, but it, it's really good for me to know so I can share that information with other folks because there was some issues in the community where people were saying, well, such and such didn't show up. Where I was able to say after a meeting last week, it's because of the information that was given. 
You have to give specific information so that the right group of people can respond. And you have to give it in a way that is intelligible. You have to be descriptive when you're calling so that the right help can get there. So I, there were other people in the community that also had like that epiphany moment, like, oh, that now makes sense. Because again, I think, you know, you call 911 and most people are like, everyone's going to show up. It doesn't matter what you say. They're just going to send everyone. Now, knowing that it doesn't make sense that everybody would come. So I, I definitely um, uh, appreciate that process now. And I'm very happy that I'm able to tell certain groups in the community, um, we, we have to be more diligent. Um, and we also have to be more specific if we need to make those phone calls and not, and actually not delay and answer the questions. Because if you're answering the specific questions, they will probably also be able to help determine what kind of help you need too. Rhoda, um, this, this, Rhoda, this is Jeff speaking uh -huh. again. Um, just so that you're aware, if you already are not, uh, a handful of years ago, the 911 center, uh, thanks to Denise, partnered with Auburn Fire Department. And when the fire department does their uh, annual fire prevention discussions with school age kids, typically that K through five, uh, the 911 center has become a partner with that so that um, when those kids are being educated on fire prevention, they also get educated on how the 911 system works and what to expect when they call 911. Uh, but wow. as you say, there's a lot of adults out there that you know their first experience is frustrating because they're asked what feels like 100 questions when all they want is help. Um, so we hear that often, and I'm sure Denise hears it much more often than, than we do even. Um, but Denise, can you address another topic that, that may come up from time to time is that when people call 911, especially in the heat of the moment, especially in the instance of a domestic uh, situation, it's not necessarily unusual for somebody to call back and say, never mind, I changed my mind, right? But that's not something once somebody calls 911, can you follow up with that, Denise, on how that plays out? Yeah, so a couple of things, Rhoda, you you were spot on with regards to the education piece, and that that's a big gap, unfortunately, um, that I, you know, we struggle with how, how do we close that? Um, you know, the incident last week that you talked about initially came in as a medical call. It, it wouldn't have warranted a law enforcement response. There was no reason for law enforcement. Um, the only reason law enforcement was sent was because the of the amount of calls that we were getting and the um develop the a lot of the callers were very very difficult um and that's what prompted dispatch to say hey we better send law enforcement um and that's really to protect our responders to make sure that we're not overlooking something um, and we're just basing it on what the information is that we're getting and and a typical um seizures call shouldn't turn into 40 phone calls into the 911 center. So, you know, they, they were proactive in saying, hey, let's send law enforcement. Um, and in, in regards to the the questions asked, that's again, it's, it's one, it's to make sure we're sending the most appropriate response. And it's also to make sure that we're protecting our responders. It's not slowing down the response because in most cases, the person asking the questions is not the person that's dispatching the responders. So they're just trying to continue to get information um, make sure that we're giving the responders every bit of information we can to protect them. In the case of a domestic, the first thing we want to know, are there drugs, alcohol, or weapons involved? Because if there's any of those things, um, we want to make sure that law enforcement knows. We, would, we never want to send them into a situation where people might have weapons. Um, so if someone calls and says, hey, you know, we had a domestic and, and I need to see somebody, you know, he's, we're fighting and then they hang up and, you know, they call back and say, we don't need a response. We're still going to send a response. The responders are, you know, 99% of the time, they're still going to say, you know, we're going to go, we're going to check out the situation to make sure it's okay. Or you get a situation where somebody calls and hangs up from a landline phone and we call back and you, you know, you kind of listen for background noises and you think something might be going on. So, you know, we'll send a response. Um, the tough part is if it's a cell phone, you know, that's, that's, we'll call back and say, you know, if there are any issues, call us back and let us know. 
Um, but anytime it's a landline number calling into 911 with a hang up, if we are going to send a response to make sure that everything is okay and that somebody's not reaching out and trying to be quiet about it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that come into play that yeah, people really just don't understand until they experience a situation. So we, we do understand that and dispatchers are trained to understand that people are going to be frustrated. Um, they're scared, they're nervous, they're worried. And, and what does that do to us? It, it spikes our adrenaline and, you know, we may not be the, the best on the other end of the phone to the dispatchers because, you know, in the heat of the moment, things come out. So, um, you know, dispatchers are trained to understand that, that a caller, you know, yelling at them is not, don't take it personal. Well, and the other, the other thing that I think is important to uh, point out is if, if the dispatcher gets a uh, inkling that the, the person either has more information or the situation is evolving, they'll keep that person on the phone for the duration until the, until a responder gets there, which I, I think is important to know as well, that they, they will, they'll continue to get updated information if they can and and provide that kind of real-time updates to the responders and, and people will talk in code it happens um you know because they, they don't want the, the other party to hear who they're talking to and and it's it's typically pretty easy to pick up on so you know like fred said we'll keep them on the phone to make sure they're safe until responders get there even if it's dead air just keeping the phone open to hear background noises Uh, this is Steve. Just as a follow-up, Denise uh, and the and the police officers on the line. Once uh, the officers have arrived on the scene, nine one one can still dispatch people. But do the officers also make their own calls and request um, sometimes uh, other other assistance themselves? Yeah. Once law enforcement is on the scene, we typically will disconnect the line. Again, it's situation dependent. You know, we. Uh, we had a situation last week where we had a young girl and she was scared because it was all male officers. So she wanted the dispatcher to stay on the phone, give her a little bit of comfort. Um, you know, we'll always do that. Um, if law enforcement gets on scene and something's um, escalated and they need reinforcements, they'll ask, you know, send us other units, get us some more units. Um, they'll do things like, you know, get units to block off traffic. So, you know, it, it can be a, an evolving process depending on what happens when they get on scene. One of the uh, topics that tends to come up is uh, the appropriate response to uh, just generically what's referred to as, you know, non-emergency calls. So we've got several folks in this group, Denise and, and Heather um, and all of our law enforcement folks. Can you speak a little bit more to, to that? Because that is a very generic term to say a non-emergency response. And could, could anybody, uh, anybody willing to speak to the difficulty of trying to determine what's an emergency and what is not? You could have things like a 911 hang up that seems like it's, you know, somebody just accidentally called 911 and disconnected the line. That's still a two, two car call. Um, so, you know, I mean, Fred and Kyle can speak to how, how they define their responses, but um, based on the incident type, it can be an automatic two car response, even if it doesn't seem like it's something um, that would warrant, you know, the, the extra body. But um, a lot of it is to protect the responders and to make sure that when they get on scene, they have the support that they need. And Denise, is that an automatic two car call, whether it's the sheriff's department or the Auburn City Police Department? Yes. Yep. Their, their responses are pretty consistent. Thank you. Or state police. Uh, it gets any of them. And for state police and the sheriff's office, when a call is dispatched, it's closest car. So if it's a two car response, we would send the two closest units to the to the incident. I, I think one of the one of the big confusions that comes up and that has come up uh, a lot since this this whole initiative started is the idea of these calls that that you know maybe on their face don't seem like they should they should be a law enforcement call somebody somebody calls 
911 and says, you know, my 20 year old brother is, is high and uh, he's, he's acting out and he's not himself. And I'm, I'm concerned for him. And, you know, the, the, uh, the reality is that we don't, there is nobody else that can, that, that you would send to that right now that you know is has the ability to have that immediate response to try and to try and do whatever needs to be done um you know even if we're trying to to uh, get these other agencies involved the the reality is that we have uh we've got law enforcement on the road and they're the the accessible and you know, most, uh, I don't know, trained for the lack of a better word, I guess, uh, entity to respond to that, to that situation. There just isn't, it, 911 can't get on the radio and, and dispatch a mental health professional to the call. Right. Law enforcement would just be the most timely response. I think from from my end, a non-emergency call, we often will call for a welfare check on our clients. So if we have a client that we're concerned about who has had some suicidal ideation in the past, they miss their appointment, we're definitely gonna call on law enforcement to do a welfare check. And most of the time we wouldn't call 911 because when we think of 911, it's like an emergency situation, like right away, we would reach out to law enforcement, you know, directly. We would call 911 um, if we have a, which I would see as more of like kind of um, an emergency situation in a sense, but not if we have a client here in the office who you know, says that they're going to harm themselves or somebody else. And then we would need like, a, if we felt that the client would need law enforcement to um, drive them, get them, transport them to the hospital because of a safety issue. But we would try the most, you know, part on our, you know, here at Cuga Counseling, if they're on site to deescalate the situation, you know, in those escalated situations, it's get, it gets difficult when we want law enforcement involved and when we try to really handle things on our own with our own, you know, crisis intervention. Just following up on, on uh, Fred Cornelius's uh, uh, characterization of, of non-criminal calls and the availability of folks, is there some way for lay people that we can understand the sort of the volume of those types of calls versus uh, criminal calls or, or other law enforcement calls? Is it more, is it half, is it like 10%? Is it, can, or is it really all over the board? It depends on what day it is and whether it's a holiday or whatever. You mean to, to filter mental health calls from Suicide from you know domestics that kind of stuff, or even even pure law enforcement calls versus I, I don't that's not a way to to characterize it but I I know I know what you mean Steve yeah I, thanks Brad. I think I think that uh, it is kind of all over the board and and it depends on the day but. Uh, you know we're we're working on some things at the sheriff's department and we're we're doing it uh much like uh the auburn police department did with uh with cayuga centers you remember all the all the, you know kids are running away from union cayuga centers and apd is getting called and you know we have that same situation with hillside across the road from us and um saturday uh, on our afternoon shift, we had three calls to Hillside because there was, you know, a, a kid who was leaving the campus or there was a kid who wouldn't get out of the car or, you know, these kind of things. And I had a, and we've had an ongoing conversation with them about what's appropriate for law enforcement and what's not. And, and, uh, and we, we respond when we're asked to respond. Um, but, we're, we're continuing to try and educate, you know, these entities that maybe law enforcement isn't the best, you know, uh, uh, agency or the best uh, 
people to respond. And sometimes you just have to take care of your own problem, you know, and, and that's, that's a reality too. Um, but if they call, you know, we don't, we, we can't just say, all right, well, the heck with it, we're not going, you know, because, because then we incur some, some significant liability, you know, then, but we are trying to, to find different ways to weed out those, those calls that, um, that, we don't necessarily need to, you know, run lights and sirens to, you know, and it, it does take up a lot of our resources. One of the ways that you could do that, and, and COVID has actually helped with, with this, is there are certain things that you can handle over the phone, you know, and and we never used to do that, and and uh, you know it was it was discouraged, and I think that sometimes, you know, having that distance and being able to 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 make that first contact remotely is not necessarily a bad, a bad way to kind of ease into that situation. Thank you. Lieutenant, you make a good point. In the, the 20 some years I was with the fire department, we saw call volume more than double in that 20 years. And I'm sure on the law enforcement side of the house, you see uh, a similar increase and interestingly enough, the population count hasn't really changed. If anything, it's probably gone in the other direction slightly. So a lot of the challenge is community expectations, right? What the community expects for a level of service and a level of response and trying to find a balance there. Fred, I have a question. You said that there are times when you can handle the situation over the phone. Um, does that leave you, like the sheriff's um, department or the police department, like in any liability situations? Well, we're, I mean, there are certain uh, things that you can handle over the phone. I mean, a, a property crime you might be able to handle over the phone. You're not going to handle an assault or, or anything where anybody was injured or anything like that. But, but, Sometimes, sometimes people call and you know immediately at the point that they're that they're calling that it's a non-criminal call. You know, I I'm having a, a an argument with my landlord about this or that. That you know, that's something that you go to court to resolve. That's not something that we're going to resolve on the spot. And we can have that conversation and maybe call both parties and say, listen, you got to, you know, act like adults and try and try and fix this so that we don't have to get actively involved Th those kind of calls i think that that could if you if you were on the scene could kind of spiral into something else if you're not there then you don't have to worry about that I, yeah. are your guys your guys because of covid and whatnot handling more things by phone yes that's interesting Kyle has often been uh, called uh, uh, gregarious, uh, loquacious. I can barely hear you for some reason. You kept cutting out on me, Fred. Rona, that doesn't change how we perform in the 911 okay. center. You know, we would still take the call, we would still dispatch it. And then if like Fred said, it's something they can handle over the phone, then that's how, how they manage it from their perspective. But we still, nothing in this in the 911 center has changed with regards to policy um, as far as how calls are dispatched. We still, still maintain. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if the trained professionals can decipher is it criminal or not? And be able to talk somebody through something or maybe even interject some logic. Um, I think that that's gonna save a lot of time and also a lot of money. Um, and I also think that it will definitely help with the, with the relations of, um, you know, be between entities and the community. I'll share with you all really quick. Um, there was an example where there was a, a lady who called the police and she basically called to say that there were some African-American men, um, and this is how she described it, men with masks on walking um, down, the, down the street. So apparently, which is a really good thing, um, whomever she spoke to basically said, where did they stop? And apparently they were stopped at the corner and the response was, they're probably going to school. If they move from the corner, 
then you call us back. But they're probably kids. And sure enough, you know, the kids got on the school bus. So like that is awesome to me because that says to me that the professionals are trained enough to decipher okay, is, is this an actual call? Let me help this person through whatever kind of perceived threat they think they're having um, and interject some logic. So that, um, when, I, when I heard that example um, last week, I thought that is, that's some awesome work. That's some awesome work. Good. Well, it's disappointing that the call came in at all, uh, <laughs> you know, but because that, you know, and, and uh, one of the things that uh, that I think the Arbor Police Department has has done over the years, just because of uh, staffing levels and and the way that they that they do business, they do it a little bit better than than we do at times. I think is is uh, having a they have a desk officer who who is a a supervisor who's there and listening and and able to 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 jump in you know and say whoa 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 whoa, whoa. I, I let me take that call I'll I'll take that call by phone or I'll call them back or no we're not sending anybody to that um you know I think that that uh because they've got somebody right there all the time they have the ability to to sometimes uh interject and maybe maybe stop a response that's unnecessary we have a supervisor on but he's not you know he might be on a call he might be someplace someplace else. He's not uh, uh, a lot of times able to as closely monitor things as we would like. And to add to what Fred's saying about that, usually what happens is a lot of times uh, the 911 center might just field those calls to us as well, where they maybe get asked some questions that maybe falls outside that scope or they're unsure whether or not it would, you know, actually need a law enforcement response at that point. So we'll sometimes get those calls as well. Denise and law enforcement, I have a question for, for you all. I'm just wondering if you have been receiving a lot of calls or maybe if you could give me an approximate number of calls from parents or caregivers um, who are having issues with, with their kids being, you know, violent, running away, those types of things. I don't think we've seen the trend increase um, you know, maybe Kyle and Fred have more information, but I don't think we've seen the trend of that increase in here. We've, we, we get those calls. I mean, <clears throat> it's not, um, out of the ordinary to get a call with a parent having a hard time with a child. Um, but, I, but as far as, you know, with COVID and kids being home, I, I don't think we've seen really a spike in that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. We haven't really seen anything that I could see that would be a, considered a spike either. So those were uh, a couple topics, obviously, that we wanted to see if uh, Denise could shed some light on and, and explain. Thank you, Denise, for your time and doing that. Um, we had some other things come up. Um, as I'm going down the list here, we talked uh, briefly, one of our points was community partners and have we included the appropriate folks as uh, and agencies or or groups as community partners? And I just am curious if uh, over the last couple of weeks, if anybody's had an opportunity to uh, think, oh, hey, you know, this is another agency or another uh, um, partner that we could involve in future discussions or um, engage in some discussion about response or or policy development or anything like that one, one of the things uh jeff that i would like to see and i know that uh that that everybody who is who is here right now has uh, a schedule that looks very much like mine um we have these individual uh meetings all the time we have a meeting with this entity and that entity and and I think that it would it, that a bigger meeting with more people involved that we could have one meeting instead of having five meetings um, 
you know, we might be able to get more done and it might free up some time on people's, on people's schedules. I, I'd like to see, you know, uh, uh, a, a few less meetings with more, more, you know, kind of concerned entities involved than, than, you know, okay, we got to go and talk because a lot of times you're talking about the same thing or a very, very slightly different, you know, slant on something and, and you go over it and we spent a lot of time doing it. And I think we could be more productive, more efficient if we had bigger meetings. Sign me up. <laughs> and Rowan, then, Rowan, did, Rowan, did you come along with, uh, we ask you to? <clears throat> what, what was that, Fred? I didn't hear you. I just wanted to know if Rhoda would come if we asked her. Well, also that's um, that's got, that opportunity will be here when we get all of the groups together uh, following these individual group meet, working group meetings, right, Jeff? Yes. Yep. So, I also want to thank Denise for taking time out of her day to to come in. Um, one of the other uh, items that were on our agenda today that we haven't hit yet is diversionary programs in courts, the alternatives to incarceration, et cetera. And if there are thoughts on how the system might be improved and we don't have to have as many community members here as we did last time, but I think good ideas for improvement can come from everybody that's on the call. So um, I don't really, I'm not the expert in this, in this uh, field, but um, is there any input anybody has on uh, the diversionary programs in the courts? Any ideas for improvement? I think that they're underutilized. I don't know why, but I definitely think that they're underutilized. So, you know, Cuga Counseling provides a lot of, of, the, of those programs in both um, Cayuga County as well, Onondaga County and Tioga County. Um, so obviously demographics being different and size being different in Onondaga County, our, our programs are probably, you know, five times the size they are here. But in, in Tioga County, it's, it's, you know, similar, very rural. And so those programs are, you know, more utilized than, than here in Cuga County. You know what would be interesting? And I don't even know if it's like against HIPAA or if this information is even out there but to see a demographic report specific to the Auburn courts on, based on age, sex, and race, who gets offered those programs and who doesn't. It would just be interesting um, because my personal thought is if we don't in some way engage the district attorney, people of color are not gonna benefit. Rhoda, yes, dear. I think that I can provide you with some of that. Um, so we track for New York State Department of Criminal Justice Services. Everybody who, um, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit harder now because of bail reform, but who gets arrested, who is, is in, at the jail. So we go out there every day, we have been, but I have like the older data that we can look at, okay. even the older data with all of that, crime, age, race, um, Sex. Sex, yep, yep, all of that kind of stuff. And then I can can give you the number of clients that we provided service to. Okay. And so we that, wouldn't really be breaking confidentiality. So I can pull all that data together. That definitely would be um, good to look at. I'll, I won't say a name, but I sit on another board with a person that um, actually is in drug court. And that person has specifically said to me, if you do not get the district attorney on board, nothing is going to change. And that person sees the disproportionality that happens with um, sentencing and who's offered um, help and who isn't offered help. And there could be similarities in terms of crime that was committed and maybe even how many times you've been offered drug court. But she, this person had seen time and time again that harsher um, less opportunities are going specifically to men of color. So just like we're done. So, and I, I think that that's the, that's the difference in the data that you're looking for, Rhoda, is not who we're providing the, the service to, 
but who is being uh, offered the opportunity to, to participate. Yes. Um, and and my my plan is, you know, to to draft kind of a a, a letter of inquiry uh, based on our discussions here in this uh, in this committee. Send it out to the to the participants for for thoughts, and then and then you know we can kind of come to a consensus on the information we're looking for from the district attorney's office, and maybe you know maybe at least try and get some answers that way. Maybe I know. But, uh, I think. It would be important that he feels um, partnered with, right? You know, like you're, we're partners because we, you know, there's things we just want to look at. Um, no point in the fingers, but if there's an area where we could possibly look at and do better, like are all parties open to that? You know, no so, judgment. So judgment I'm, free zone. I'm not. Uh, I, I'll tell you that I I hear. Um, in in the circles that I travel in, I hear the the differences being um, that offers get made to people who who have addiction problems that are not uh, selling right. So if someone is is quote unquote, and this is a a, a term of art, I think a drug dealer. Then, then they don't get afforded any opportunities, and then, and then you have to ask yourself. I think, what is a drug dealer? You know, is somebody who sold drugs to a friend, you know, and 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 made either very little money or no money at all, you know, and it's it's not a it's not their their livelihood. Is that person a drug dealer? Is someone who sells drugs to support their addiction? Yeah. A drug dealer, and I and I've argued that that they're not, and that they we we need to treat that that differently. I think that someone who sits at home and capitalizes on the addiction of other people, that's a different story. That's a that's a pariah, and and they they deserve some some harsher treatment. Justice, absolutely. Yeah. But Fred, the the courts, the felony drug court, at least. <laughs> um, capacity wise can accommodate many more clients than they are now. Oh, absolutely. We're, we're I mean, there. You're empty. Yeah. And, and that's unfortunate. Um, so I agree with Heather. I think many of these diversion programs are underutilized. So this is Steve. It would be interesting um, to know why. This is, yes, that, that is a good point, Rhoda. Often when there are um, programs, there's usually policies and guidelines written to say this is how the program is meant to be implemented. And then there's a whole another world where once the programs are in place and they're operating, the practice of how they get implemented may be the same or similar or very different from the policies that were envisioned when the program was created and people were thoughtful about what's the best way to roll this out and have this program operate. Do these programs, the various alternative to court programs have written policies that say this is how the program is to be run and people are going to be provided access to these programs, for example? Yes, Steve, so I can just talk about mine. So but can I just, circle back for a minute. Rhoda, I will not have the data on drug court because we don't implement that, the service for that program. And I do also want to say about the data, the limitations. Yeah. I won't know from the data that I have um, any previous criminal history unless I mean, there might be some way because I do have the names to like look at that, but I'm not sure if that goes into consideration when they're determining who um, they're going to make the referral to as well or offer, you know, an alternative program. So I think that that's important to keep in mind that there will be some limitations to that data. Um, Steve, definitely, yes, you know, we have policies and procedures for that. We have a referral process, who is appropriate, how to get that referral um, to us. And I, I also will say that, you know, 
these programs have been around for a really, really long time. Um, and I kind of inherited them, you know, mental health is my background. Um, so I kind of inherited the, you know, alternative programs, which I really believe in though, I, you know, um, but as far as um, how referrals, you know, get to us and how, you know, that whole piece, I'm wondering if there's any way you know, that we could intervene sooner before it gets to, you know, the arrest. It's like arrest, go to court, and then refer to the program. Can the law, I mean, this is, I guess, a question for law enforcement or her, you know, maybe Lloyd might know this. Can by law, legally, can a law enforcement entity choose diversion instead of um, making arrest? like our pretrial diversion program. Well, for, instance. for juveniles, but not for adults that I know of. So okay. I think that there's, yeah, there's, I there's a couple of things uh, that tie into that. One is, you know, law enforcement has some uh, discretion when they, you know, make an arrest or don't make an arrest. Uh, you, you run into some problems as a police officer if you're not, you know, being very judicious in how you how you utilize that discretion because you don't want to be accused of being, you know, playing favorites or being, right. being you know, partial to one one entity over another. Um, I think that um, you know they're they're it's not completely out of the question for nonviolent crimes, you know. And, and honestly, there's, there's a kind of a mechanism uh, called the statute of limitations that, you know, you, you would have the ability to, to uh, potentially say, you know, we're kind of holding this in abeyance until, you know, to, to see if you complete this program or, or not. That, that's an awful lot for, for law enforcement to take on that kind of monitoring and, and stuff like that. So oftentimes the, when somebody, you know, may deserve a, uh, uh, you know, some kind of sentence like that or some kind of program like that, we're, we're, we're hoping that that gets addressed at the, at the district attorney's office and that they, that they, you know, take those kind of factors into consideration. But, um, because it, it's not impossible, but it would be a, it would be very hard to manage that at a law enforcement level. Okay, thanks. So again, this came up last week as well when we refer to the district attorney's office. It's it's really the whole office as well. I mean, there's levels of. Um, uh, uh, employees and staff that are decision makers, not just the district attorney uh, uh, himself or herself. You know, well, that's, that's not exactly true. It's got to go through John first. Okay, so so there it is a hierarchy then, Lloyd. Yes. Okay. Well, that's we interesting, Lloyd. We just um, carried out through the department. I mean, I mean, uh, his assistant DA Diane, uh, who is in charge of all the DWIs, um, you know, in order for her to participate on any external committees, um, she needs approval from her boss. So. Yeah. I think if you want anybody other than John to participate, uh, you have to go through John first. The reason why I say that's interesting because about a year ago, myself and Chad were writing some letters because we were advocating for a person that was um, in jail waiting to be, um, you know, go to court so that it can be decided what happens. And I wrote a letter to John and he wrote me back. It was a kind response. But he told me he had nothing to do with it. He was not overseeing it. That's interesting. Lloyd, can you explain the process to us? In terms of, I don't understand your question. Like how, 
an arrest, I guess, like an arrest takes place, then somebody presents in court. How is all of that? So does the DA's office make a recommendation to the judge about a diversion program or an alternative? That's how, like, or, or does the defense attorney or assigned counsel get to have a role in that? How, how does all of that work? The, the, at our new, new cap court at the public safety building, um, unless it's a felony arrest, the district attorney's office is not represented. So it's, it's purely between the defense attorney and the judge in which the defense attorneys can recommend one of your options at your agencies, um, pretrial release. Mm -hmm. um, the defense attorney could recommend an ROR, um, depends on whether it's qualifying or non-qualifying event. Um, there's, there's a lot that a defense attorney can recommend to the judge um, because the DA's office is not there. If it's a felony, usually the judge, uh, the cap judge will um, contact the DA's office in terms of bail recommendations. Um, but ultimately it would be the, the judge would be the one to set bail uh, or not set bail. Um, but the defense attorney is always there. Whereas the DA's office necessarily is not always there. Okay. Well, and, and the, but that's uh, just as a point of clarification, um, Lloyd's talking about pre- Pre, yep, detent yeah, pre-detention. Yeah, pre-detention. So how about alternatives to incarceration or like, alternative sentencing? Like the specialty courts, you're wondering what the process is. Like, like you're convicted of, of DWI. So, uh, instead of going to prison, you're going to do, uh, misdemeanor or felony drug court. What's the process to get that in place? Is that your question? Yeah. All of them, the whole realm. So yeah. So that would, would have been, yeah. Follow up. Well, I mostly know about pre, pre. Um, you know, once a recommendation is agreed upon by the DA's office, the defense attorney and the courts, um, you know, I'm not sure how that process works. It's all, you know, between the three plus the defendant, obviously. So uh, many of the defense attorneys, um, you know, know about the alternative programs, know about drug court uh, we're looking at the the memorandum memorandum of understanding with the new opioid court, um, so that's going to be another another option. Um, so the defense attorneys um, know what options are available to them, and you know they they try to 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 work those options in as as best they can, so that the defendant is not facing jail time. So one of the one of the things that's important and to know. Of, excuse me, Fred. Some of them know. Some of the defendants would rather do the jail time because yeah. they don't want to be a year in drug court. Yeah. They'd rather yeah. go to jail, get it done, instead of spending, you know, every week in drug court. Yeah, we see a lot of that with respect, which is for batterers, our the group that we operate for batterers, because it is it's a year, you know, it's a year long program every week, and so we do see um, them want to choose that route to do their ninety days or you know whatever it may be. So the the uh, the one important thing I think to note is that the. Uh, the judge, if someone's convicted of, of X crime, the judge cannot sentence them to drug court uh, over the objections of the district attorney. That's it, The district attorney has to agree that it's an appropriate thing. I, I did not know that. And can you clarify, Fred, that that's not for the pre-trial diversion? This is when you're at the... This is yeah. it. It's sentencing. Yeah. So it would be what we would refer to as an, you know, alternative to incarceration, an ATI program. Right. 
And uh, then Fred, basically the judge ha- or Lloyd, both either, the judge has the last say for, for the other programs. For the, for like the drug court or something like that, you mean? Yeah. So like, say yeah. like for a uh, community service or for pretrial diversion or, you know, any of the other alternatives, like somebody would make a recommendation and then the judge ultimately would have the final say. He can, uh, yeah, he can agree to it and say, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. Or he can say, go back and, and work something else out because I'm not, I'm not comfortable with this sentence, but um Usually, you know, the vast majority of cases are resolved with some sort of agreed upon sentence. And, and in order for that agreed upon sentence to include a alternative court, uh, you know, an alternative court like, like the diversion court or the, the uh, uh, drug court or, you know, domestic violence court, court. Or mm-hmm. any of those, any of those things, uh, the, the, uh, the DA is the gatekeeper for that. They they have to they have to agree that that's something. It can't be it, it can't be imposed without their say so. The judge can say no, but it, that would be pretty unusual. As long as we're discussing this, and and Fred, you might be able to uh, answer this question, uh, and Lloyd, perhaps, are these alternatives programs that the DA um, has to agree to, are they generally looked at as as good alternatives by the DA's office? Understanding that it's on a case by case basis, but are they, are, are they, are they supported? Are they seen as good? Are there aspects of these programs that if they were different, they'd be more likely to be used? And I'm just going on Lloyd, and he might have been talking pretrial diversion, but I'm going on Lloyd saying that many of these programs are not utilized as much as they could be used. Uh, Sorry, a lot of lot of questions thrown out there, gentlemen. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not sure uh, with drug court, um, Fred, you're a part of that. Uh, why there there aren't more participants? I think that. Uh, I think that I think that there are there are portions of the the district attorney's office that are very supportive of the alternative uh, courts, you know, and 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 some people are appropriate and some people aren't, but um, I think that there there could probably be a a bigger buy-in and and I think that that we have to we have to as a as a criminal justice system, we have to kind of redefine our idea of justice. And, and sometimes, sometimes justice isn't the biggest prison number that we can, that we can get. Sometimes justice is, is something else. And um, even, even if you've got a, a slam dunk case and, you know, the, the sentence could be five to 15 or whatever, that might not be, you know, you could also get probation, but we might be able to get this 15, you know, I, that's not always the, 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 the measure of justice. And that's, that's something that, uh, that I think that we can do a better job of defining what that means. I'll be honest with you, I am fighting back tears, Fred, because that that's profound, what you just said, profound. Well, thank you. Steve, if I could uh, jump in real quick, I think, you know, another, and I haven't been involved in, in behavioral health or drug court in a number of years, but you asked a question about why aren't more participants involved. I mean, these are very labor intensive um, courts for staffing. Um, they, they take a lot of time. Um, I, they're limited with the number of participants they can have because of the staffing uh, restrictions. And, you know, I, I know the year was mentioned. I remember uh, some behavioral health um, clients uh, they were in the in the in the um, diversionary course for well over a year, upward to two, maybe even more than that. So it goes a long, long time. 
Um, and, you know, you, you have failures where they get set back. And um, some of the frustrations also, you know, from maybe law enforcement side of it is, um, and, and I say frustrations, you know, my mindset has changed over the years, but there aren't I, what would what we would see as um, there's not a I'm trying to choose my words correctly or, or best, but accountability is not always uh, at the forefront um, from what our perspective is. If you fail um, for whatever reason, or if you continue to commit, or the actions or the acts that got you in this original um, predicament, um, you know, from a law enforcement perspective there's not always the accountability that you would expect from the court in these systems. Um, I have a, a mixed view or a mixed uh, uh, take on that, but long, long, uh, long story short, it, it's, they're very labor intensive. Um, they, they, you know, if the system's going to work, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of effort, a lot of money. Um, I, I definitely believe in, the diversionary courts, but I don't think they're a panacea, a panacea for everybody like Fred said. Uh, it takes the right person uh, to, to be in the system to have it work, and that's not always the case. Thank you, Chief. That's great uh, feedback uh, for everybody on this conversation. Um, so we've talked a lot about the alternatives to court. Uh, we talked about, um, I guess that it does include community court. Uh, we've talked about community partners. Um, one of the last things under alternative to police response on the agenda today is uh, it's the bullet says explanations from the community. What kind of police force response do you want or expect? Uh, discuss the survey results. I have to say, Chief, thank you for, uh, first of all, for sharing uh, the final sort of tally, I, I, if it is the final one or the most recent tally of the survey results. I was amazed by um, you know, how many people really did take time to respond and the responses um, you know, were, were diverse uh, from different groups of people. Um, fr from, from, the, from your department's perspective, how, how, what's the read on the expectations from the community that came from the response perhaps? Um, so just to let you know, we're going to keep it uh, live. It's going to be ongoing, but we are sharing the ongoing tally every week. Every Monday, we post those uh, for anybody that hasn't had a chance to look at them. Overall, I'm I'm pleased. Um, I'm glad people have the opportunity to uh, voice their opinions. I think there's some great information in there to help us, and that's what it's all about. Is you know, it gives people a safe uh, place to really voice their opinions about how we're doing or where they think we can do better. Uh, focus more energy, more time and effort. Um, I, I'm, but overall, you know, you look at those those big questions. Yeah, were you treated with dignity and respect? Um, you know, what was the re, uh, what was the interaction you had with uh, our officers? Where could we do better? What do you want to see from us? I, I think it's some great information there, and I think it's really going to be helpful when we use that information, not only for the community forums, but also. Uh, to, to put into the plan uh, of action going forward, which is the culmination of this whole process here. I think it's a, it's a great uh, roadmap uh, ahead for us. Okay. Uh, and I'm hoping that every uh, other folks on the call have uh, reviewed uh, the, the survey results that uh, Chief Butler passed around to everybody. Um, and they were uh, very broad in their responses um, from a broad section of the community. And I know, uh, Chief, that you uh, did some outreach. Uh, you shared that with the group uh, to try to get uh, better representation in the community and with some success. Yeah, uh, definitely there is some success there, but you know, it's always a work in progress. Um, you know, I want to say to, to Rhoda, and um, members of the social justice task force, you know, they definitely um, pushed it out to the uh, minority community. Um, we did, you know, see the numbers uh, go up quite a bit, but you know, there's still work to be done. So uh, it's not uh, not a complete success, but you know, we did get a more diversified uh, response. And I know that the county as well, 
um, you know, they've gotten some great response as well. Anybody else have any feedback on expectations from the community, what they picked up from the survey? No, but Steve, I think the next two meetings that are going to be community wide open to the general public, I think we'll hopefully get some good uh, discussion going with those things and some of the obviously some of the topics we've talked about here and amongst the three groups, I'm sure we'll come back up. Um, so I'm glad we're doing a little bit of homework ahead of time so that we can share some of this ongoing dialogue and, and that's going to be one of our challenges, I think, right now, based on the last conversation we had and today's conversation, one of our major challenges is how do we communicate? How do we communicate some of this information out to the general public so the general public has a better understanding of how the system works? because I think there's a, a lot of confusion, a lot of misinformation out there. Um, it's not a perfect system, but there's a lot more to it than the average citizen realizes. So uh, some way to at least make sure that that information's out there in some sort of a format that's accessible. And we've got a, we've got a, uh, uh, an additional uh, burden or an additional struggle with, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to do some community meetings that, that involve, you know, kind of the far reaches of the county, we're going to have to, to reach out and, and, you know, we'll, we'll definitely participate with, with what's going on, you know, in the central part of the county and the, and the city and the town surrounding the, the city, but we're going to have to, we're going to have to do something down south and we're going to have to do something up north to, to get a good cross section of the people that that the uh, the sheriff's department serves, and and that's not going to be an easy thing. We're we're talking about a, a, a couple of different you know ways to do that, and and it's even harder now with uh, with the spike in COVID cases because technology isn't the greatest in the in the the north and the south. So. So uh, we we would have liked to have just had some some in person community forums, which are, aren't going to aren't going to happen now. So we're uh, we're we're still figuring it out, but one way or another, we'll get it done. We'll involve the people that we need to involve. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Jeff, the last thing that we have on our agenda today is with regard to procedural justice. Um, there's three bullets. One is on implicit bias, alternatives to improve training. One is de-escalation, de-escalation technique, what happens in these situations. And one is about transparency and media public communication. We touched on a few of these things in our last meeting, but they're on the agenda for today. Um, does anybody, implicit bias, de-escalation or transparency, does anybody have any thoughts to share on on procedures or any of these or how the policies are touching on these, the proposed policies are touching on these? Well, Steve, there was quite a bit of discussion last at the last meeting that we did here about what the Sheriff's Department and Auburn Police Department had done with implicit bias training, both the initial entry level uh, for their new folks um, and then the annual training. One of the things we've talked about, at least as a city, is, you know, uh, this goes beyond just the police department. It goes, uh, you know, throughout the organization. And uh, that's something we are continuing to look at how we can roll that out, uh, make it uh, impactful and meaningful. Um, throughout the organization, including boards and commissions and, and things like that. So that would be something that's ongoing uh, with us. I believe the school district did something similar uh, in the last year or two. And de-escalation, I don't know, I had to jump off that last meeting due to a council meeting. So I'm not sure where you ended up on the, the last two bullet points actually myself.
we uh, we, talked, ahead, we talked a little bit about uh, about both of those things. De de-escalation is a uh, is a you know and it uh, it's involved in a lot of different areas of uh, of our training and and of you know police training in general. Uh, obviously, it's the it's the first option or the the option that we want to take all the time be before we you know deal with any any kind of force situation um but uh greg did you have something else i don't fred no touch uh, everything i'll just add fred um the escalation is not new it's just a new term um, you know, we, we could call it verbal judo or a million different things that anybody's been any length of time in policing, but, you know, it, it's obviously definitely something that uh, has come to the forefront in, in a way to um, reduce the use of force hands on and it's it's effective communication is basically all it comes down to is to not um, uh, incite or, or make a situation worse where you whereby you have to use force. If you can use your words to, you know, um, make a situation, uh, make uh, convince somebody to become compliant or get them into the ambulance to go get mental health uh, assistance. And it's, it's just effective communication is really uh, what it, it boils down to. And uh, as we know, with generational changes, um, you know, our newer, younger officers communicate in a different way. Uh, if they could pull out their phones and text message uh, uh, a way for somebody to uh, calm down or it, it's just, and I, and I say that in, in joking around, but it's something we really have to focus on through generational changes in our uh, police department is individuals communicate differently based on the different generations they come from. So it, we have to focus on those changes. We have to adapt to those and make sure that our our younger officers, as well as our, our elders like us, um, you know, uh, stay up to speed on those skills. And it is a skill. Not everybody's a great talker. Um, some, I could put Joe Volano in a certain situation. I know he could take it one way or another. <laughs> he could communicate with some people, but others, maybe not. But, you know, it, it's utilizing those different skill sets in, in different, um, you know, Chris Major is one of our crisis hostage negotiators he can talk the bark off of a tree uh, but that's really what it, it comes down to it's just a, a new hot term that has risen to the surface of uh, uh, the society and media it's, but it's been around for a long time well and, the, and it's it's a uh, an area like you said that uh, with the younger people we've we've had to to really kind of look at our field training program a little bit differently because because you know 10 years ago you didn't have to you didn't have to really teach somebody how to have a face-to-face -face conversation and now i mean that's just not a, a skill that that kids are coming to us with and you know if they haven't got a, a phone or some kind of electronic uh, gadget to communicate with it's a it's a real struggle and that's that's something we're having to, to kind of start from square one and teach them. You know, Chief Butler, if I could add, um, I, I try to ride with the department at least once a year, sometimes twice. And the one thing that I always walk away with is um, the efforts by whoever I ride with to de-escalate every situation and every call that we go on. Um, I, I, it never ceases to amaze me. And I find myself, you know, when we show up to the call, I'm getting worked up, but I'm listening to the officer try to de-escalate the situation from, from the onset. So I know that the efforts are there continuously, and it's, it's actually a pretty impressive thing to watch. Appreciate that. Can I ask law enforcement a question? Mm -hmm. Just about the mental health training. So I know, um, Sean, I'm not sure about the sheriff's department, but um, did send some officers 
through mental health first aid. So I think that de-escalation, I mean, obviously it's a huge thing, very important, but I also think equally important is often to um, educate the responders about mental health issues. And, you know, what does a bipolar person look like? What does, you know, how can I, what, what does a schizophrenic look at look like? What do they think? What, what, you know, how are they thinking? Like those types of things, because they think that, you know, you all are encountering that obviously. And I'm not quite sure how much training, you know, um, at the academy or ongoing training is devoted to that type of training. Well, you know, in, again, training, it'd be great if our officers could train all the time, but unfortunately, uh, the reality is we also have to, um, you know, work the road, work the streets and, and training costs money. And I'm not making excuses, but this is the reality of it. You know, in the academy, they touch on all these things. Uh, but if you break it down and look at the, the syllabus, it might be four hours for this or eight hours for that. Um, because they have so much curriculum they have to jam into, what is it now, Fred, 900 hours, somewhere around there? More, okay, 1,200. I'm, I'm not sure what the, the curriculum is now, but um, the reality of it, yeah, they might touch on it, but uh, we're not, you know, we're not getting down to the nitty gritty of identifying individuals as bipolar, uh, <laughs> like, like you said, Heather. Um, it, it's it's really tough to try to hit on every aspect that society, and I'm going to speak real, dumps on policing mm -hmm. um, as, as we are, you know, the first responders for all these ills in society, but we can't do it all because we are not, you know, we're not trained experts in all these things and our partnerships, you know, how to get you guys more integrated with us. We're, we're, trying we're starting um you know with our with our um, victim specialist and our cit response and all these other different things but unfortunately you're not there at three in the morning when we might need you um it, it's tough I, I don't know what the answer is um you know training is great when we can do it but we can't become experts in all these things you know we're, we're the jack of all trades uh the master of none and that's very very true in our profession. Um, but, you know, we, we're going to do our best and we're going to throw as much as we can onto our people, but we're human and, and we, you know, we, we don't have the, the ability to do it all and do it all to the best uh, that everybody wants us to. That's, that's the reality of it. I know that um, the Sheriff's Department sent several, so the state DCGS has a week long um, training that actually goes in more in depth to you know showing the different types of mental health the different things that you're going to encounter what it looks like how to handle those types of, of depending on what the person is whether they're bipolar whether they're you know this that or the other um i know auburn sent several people through it uh the sheriff's department has sent uh, many people through it as well part of the problem right now with covid you yeah. know, we had people scheduled to go you know to to more trainings and you know they got canceled because of covid um, so there, there are programs out there, but again, you know, like Chief Butler said, it's, it's a matter of getting people to the training and having the time for people to be able to go through it. Sean, I have another question for you, a follow-up. Was that you advocating for a joint mental health law enforcement response? Absolutely. Sure. That's what I thought. And we need it. <laughs> you, you know, we, we definitely I need know. it. We need a uh, mobile crisis to be 24 hours. We, we need a lot of things. And that's where, you know, it's going to be, everybody's pushing from the top for all these reforms, but that's the reform we need is, is, you know, defunding the police. Well, put the money where your mouth is. And, and that, that's the reality of it. Again, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's tough. I think Heather brings up a good point and, and the training and, and the mental health aspect of it. And Chief, I'm full aware, fully aware of the um, budgetary constraints for training. You know, so when we send this on to the state, is there an opportunity for us to also send our requests and our recommendations to say that, you know, these initiatives are great, but we locally lack the funding to accomplish a lot of these things, and we need more of an investment from the state in order to do that. And, you know, again, that word defund, 
the reality of it is everything else has already been defunded. Now the last thing they want to talk about is defunding the police. Um, and, and because of all that previous defunding, all these problems have been dumped on law enforcement. Well, um, I think Heather and Ray can really speak to, you know, the defunding of the mental health system and it's, it's come to bear on policing, you know, uh, shutting down institutions and not to say that institutionalizing certain individuals is the right reason, but having the alternative and having those bed spaces available, um, now they're no longer. And, you know, these individuals are all on outpatient care and we are the ones that are, are you know, to bear that cross. And it's, it's not easy and it's, it's very unfortunate. Definitely. Outpatient care with cuts to our original funding. So we can't even staff a higher level. So it's, yeah, definitely difficult. And we do depend on law enforcement a lot to help us. Counselor, I, I would, you know, definitely um, impress that. I think you bring up a good point, you know, kind of putting it back on the state and writing this into our plan is, you know, these are things that we have, um, talked about and discussed is, is problem areas and, and we need we need your help um, reform all the way around. It's not just on police, it's we need your help to uh, help the police uh, provide these services in, in our communities in, in general. We, we just need to be cautious in our in our wording when we're uh, when we're crafting that because I I worry about that defunding coming back up when we have that conversation. Okay, well, we want more uh, mental health, you know, response, which absolutely we need. Uh, we can we can take that money out of uh, you know three police officers and two deputies' salaries, you know, and that, and that's a that's a real concern that that we have to uh, we have to be able to show that we're that we're effectively using our manpower that we have right now and we need additional help. It's not, you know, that we, that we can uh, afford to lose people to, you know, pay for these. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I didn't mean to say that in regards to here locally, Fred, but, uh, and I'm looking at the, the larger municipalities, you know, where they're taking billions away you sure. know, or, or playing, you know, the, the shell game with that money. Um, no, absolutely. We, we definitely can't afford that here. Uh, like I showed in our community presentation to the social justice um, task force, there is no, unless you're cutting bodies, there's no money to take. We don't have discretionary funding like you might in other agencies, in larger agencies. Well, we've been pretty much through the entire agenda today. Um, uh, Jeff, can you clarify a little bit what the next steps are? I believe, is it next week that we have a group meeting? Um, I don't recall, I think it's the 15th. So yes, it would be next week. There'll be a community meeting. So we will uh, we'll advertise that. We've got to make sure that that word gets out. Uh, it'll be a Zoom meeting similar to this. Am I on? I'm okay. I thought I might have been still on mute. Um, in the, the short term, we'll get the meeting notes together for this meeting. Um, we will send that information out to all of you and to all the other groups that are meeting. Um, I just sent myself a reminder to get hold of Guy Cosentino. I haven't heard from him. Uh, Chief Butler, you were hopscotching on these meetings. Do you know if he was sitting in on any of the others? He already signed off. Did he? Okay. All right. Well, that's good. Uh, so Guy Cosentino is going to uh, MC, if you will, the uh, community meetings, at least those two on the uh, December 15th, and I think it might be January 5th, if I recall. Anyway, there'll be two of those. Uh, we'll see what kind of discussion comes up there. Um, during those meetings, we'll cover uh, these broad topics and um, see what kind of feedback we get from the community. Uh, it will be an opportunity to have some two-way discussion with the community as we've, as we've done here and we've kind of worked through a few things and uh, know what some of those topics will be. Uh, so that will be good. Um, and 
in the background, we've had folks working on our plan for the city, and I'm sure that's happening on the county side as well. And uh, these community meetings will help to inform that plan. And um, also they're part of the, the basic requirement of EO203. So uh, we'll start to get that together. Uh, I don't expect this to be in the end all um, dialogue. If anything else, what this has done, it's raised some interesting questions, some interesting um, problems or, or uh, challenges for us to get through. And uh, right from the beginning, we knew we'd have topics that would come up that we wouldn't be able to fully address. So these are just the first, I look at them as they're, they're the kickoff meetings to an ongoing dialogue. And those ongoing dialogues will, <coughs> excuse me, inform uh, procedural changes potentially in the future. Uh, they may inform some budget discussions as you've just talked about. Um, they could inform um, partnerships, future partnerships and strengthening partnerships, creating new partnerships to try to more appropriate meet the need, appropriately meet the needs of the community. So um, I, I don't think this project ever really gets done, right? We'll get the first, the, the big part of it done and there'll be continue to be discussions beyond that. And I think that trying to, to get that message across to the community is going to be important as well. Build a little bit of trust, uh, improve some communication and um, have some education out there. As, as we've seen, even in today's discussion, I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding or lack of information about how various systems work, whether it's calling for help or moving through the uh, court system, there, there's certainly room for us to do better at educating the public on how the system works. That always seems to be a problem. How do you navigate through all these different aspects? Mm. Great, thoughts? thank you, Jeff. I, I, does anybody have any thoughts to share uh, as a group before we wrap up today's? Of course, uh, Jeff and I will try to capture as best we can the, the notes. It's kind of a, uh, you know, a, an ongoing dialogue today, a little bit more. So we've been trying to take notes. I know Jeff has as well, and we'll put those together and circulate them uh, before the end of the week, most likely. And um, does anybody have anything to share with everybody before we close the meeting? I want to make sure we thank everybody for your time and commitment to working on this project and I know we'll have uh, some continued continued discussions and uh, you know this is this is a great start to things. If nobody else has got anything we'll let you get on with the rest of your afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Appreciate Thank your participation. Thank you, Jeff. We'll be in touch. Thanks, Steve. Have a good night.